Hi, my name is Miranda Berger and I'm the program manager with Olympic Community of Health, the Accountable Community of Health or ACH serving the Olympic region. Value-based purchasing or contracting is an important component to healthcare authorities, healthcare transformation efforts, and is an area of high importance and needed support in the Olympic region. This presentation is a case study that provides a look at the challenges, successes, and opportunities in the Olympic region in hopes that it will guide future decision making and regional next steps. Before we dive into the content, I'd like to pause here and ground us in a land acknowledgement. OCH is proud to partner with the seven sovereign tribal nations located within the region and would like to acknowledge with humility the indigenous peoples whose presence permeates the waterways, shorelines, valleys, and mountains of the Olympic region. The land of the region is the traditional territory of the Chimicum, Ho, Macaw, Sklalem, Suquamish, and Quileute tribes, and we are privileged to live, work, and play in such a sacred place. The purpose of this presentation is to promote advancement of healthcare authorities' efforts to transform healthcare by ensuring Washington residents have access to better health and better care at lower costs. This case study provides a look at the challenges, successes, and opportunities in the Olympic region specifically. And our hope is that this will guide future statewide as well as regional decision making and next steps. This presentation really is the culmination of a cross-sector collaborative group from our region. The purpose of the value-based purchasing action group was to identify challenges, gaps, as well as advocate for creative solutions to expand and improve VBP efforts across Clallam, Jefferson, and Kitsap counties. The VBP action group is comprised of regional partners, including both of the FQHCs in our region, hospitals, primary care, behavioral health, substance use disorder providers, and community-based organizations. In addition to our regional partners, all five of the managed care organizations and a healthcare authority representative have been key partners in this work. First, it's helpful to set a little bit of background and context about the Olympic region and our health serving partners. The Olympic region spans Clallam, Jefferson, and Kitsap counties and includes the seven sovereign nations of the Ho, Jamestown Sklalem, Lower Elwha Clallam, Macaw, Port Gamble Sklalem, Quileute, and Suquamish tribes. Clallam and Jefferson counties comprise the largely rural Olympic Peninsula. Port Angeles is the largest city and the seat of Clallam County and has a population of just over 20,000. Forks is the largest town and healthcare access point on the west end of Clallam County, with a population of approximately 3,600 and one critical access hospital. It's about a one hour journey by car to travel the 24 miles from the Ho Reservation to the closest healthcare access point on the west end of Clallam County. Port Townsend has a population just under 10,000 and is the seat of Jefferson County. It's also home to the only hospital in Jefferson County. It's about 38 miles and takes a little less than one hour to travel from Brennan in South Jefferson County to Port Townsend. Public transportation is severely limited throughout most of the Olympic Peninsula and many locations are only accessible by use of private vehicle. The Olympic Peninsula is home to the very beautiful Olympic National Park and no through access is available in the National Park, which elongates travel times around the region. Access from the Olympic Peninsula to Kitsap County is most commonly and conveniently made via the Hood Canal floating bridge, which closes daily due to leisure, commercial and military marine traffic, as well as unfavorable weather conditions. Kitsap County is more suburban with a population of over 272 um, hundred, and has several city centers in addition to the rural outreaches of Olala, Seabeck, and Hansville. Kitsap County's commuting population has steadily increased as access to Seattle becomes more convenient through a 30-minute fast ferry ride. In recent years, public transportation has grown, including the use of some rideshare services, but these options are still really limited compared to larger cities, and the most common and convenient transportation is still use of private vehicle. 
The Olympic Region Health Network is primarily made up of small providers and very few large health systems have a presence in our region. The Olympic Region houses four hospitals, one each in Jefferson and Kitsap counties and two in Clallam County. Two of the hospitals, Forks Community Hospital in Clallam and Jefferson Healthcare in Jefferson, are designated as critical access. For severe acute health care services, travel out of the region is often necessary. It's really common to be referred and receive specialty care down in Kitsap, Pierce, and King counties. The Olympic region also has two federally qualified health centers, or FQHCs, one in Port Angeles, North Olympic Healthcare Network, and the other, Peninsula Community Health Services, with locations in the major city centers as well as mobile services down in Kitsap County. Two tribes are established, um, have established FQHCs as well, the Jamestown Sklalem Tribe and the Port Gamble Sklalem Tribe. Um, in Kitsap County, Peninsula Community Health Services, the FQHC, is the main Medicaid primary care provider and the only provider for Medicaid adult dental services. CHI Franciscan and Virginia Mason are another, another relatively large presence with the only hospital and several affiliated clinics. An ample community-based organization network exists addressing many determinants of health in Kitsap County. Despite robust program expansions, including mobile services, long wait lists persist for new and existing clients, particularly for specialty care. In Jefferson County, Jefferson Healthcare is the largest health system, comprising of a hospital, primary care, dental, behavioral health, and some specialty care. Most services and supports are centralized to the city of Port Townsend, leaving outlying communities with long distances to travel. Many community-based organizations serve both Jefferson and Kitsap County, or sorry, Jefferson and Clallam counties. Clallam County comprises two centralized healthcare networks, one in Port Angeles and Squim, and the West End, which includes the West End of Jefferson County as well. In the Port Angeles Squim area, Olympic Medical Center, North Olympic Healthcare Network, and the Jamestown Family Health Clinic provide the majority of Medicaid services. On the West End, the Quileute, Ho, and Macaw tribes offer limited services and rely on care from Forks Community Hospital and Primary Care, as well as long distances to Port Angeles, Squim, and further. Outside of integrated services offered through the two FQHCs and four mental health agencies in our region, all substance use disorder services are offered via independently owned and operated small businesses with staffing sizes typically less than 20. Only one clinical assisted withdrawal management facility, which has nine beds, Kitsap Recovery Center, is available in the region and is located on the very south end of Kitsap County. Of the seven tribes, six are Indian healthcare providers. Each tribe is unique and provides a range of services for their community. For example, the Jamestown Sklalem Family Health Clinic is a tribal FQHC and actually primarily serves non-tribal members and offers comprehensive primary care dental and works to expand behavioral health services. The Jamestown Healing Clinic, a substance use disorder facility, offers integrated services, including dental for folks with opioid use disorder. The Port Scala Port Gamble Sklalem Health Clinic primarily serves tribal members, including members from neighboring tribes. Travel can be a major obstacle for services not provided by the tribes, including urgent and critical care. It takes over an hour to travel from the Macaw Reservation to the nearest hospital in Forks and nearly two hours to reach Port Angeles for specialty referrals and level three trauma care. It's common for tribal members to travel to Bremerton and Seattle four to five hours one way by private vehicle from Quileute, Ho, or Macaw to access specialty care. Next, I'm going to provide just a little bit of background to what led to this presentation and case study. As an on-time adopter for integrated managed care, the Olympic region did not receive funds to support integration efforts. Clallam County was the only county in Washington state that did not have managed care for primary care prior to the launch of integrated managed care. This posed additional unique challenges for our region. 
Prior to integrated managed care, all five MCOs had a presence in the Olympic region. And then when we transitioned to IMC, the region went to three MCOs. And now in 2021, this has expanded and all five MCOs are now present again. In March of 2020, statewide lockdowns were initiated in response to COVID-19 and providers necessarily solely focused on COVID-19 response for much of the year. While on high alert from the beginning, our region did not see significant case rates until the fall of 2020, and many providers requested adaptations to MCO contracts through 2020 and 2021 as COVID severely impacted their ability to work towards targets and goals unrelated to COVID-19 response. OCH hosted several convenings throughout the Medicaid Transformation Project to promote collaboration and shared learning across regional and statewide partners. Along the way, we have promoted the value-based payment survey and tracked regional gaps, challenges, and opportunities in this work. We've also compiled partner feedback on gaps, challenges, and opportunities with VBP. And in 2019, we hosted a convening that included both MCOs and community-based organizations to better understand the role of community-based organizations in VBP efforts. In 2021, we revisited this work and hosted a convening of regional and statewide partners to promote shared understanding and conversations to address the regional concerns in VBP. At this convening, partners decided to bring together a smaller group of folks to continue action-oriented conversation. And in March of this year, OCH launched the VBP Action Group. The Olympic region seeks to support healthcare authorities aim to contain costs while improving outcomes, patient and provider experience. According to the most recent data, the Olympic region decreased penetration of MCO VBP by 7%. We were at 82% in 2020 and 75% in 2021. While the rest of Washington state increased or stayed the same, this has had great financial impacts for our region under the Medicaid Transformation Project VBP Pay for Performance Incentives. We only earned 20, a little over $22,000 in Pay for Performance Incentives and lost out on the majority of funds, which was about $450,000. This could have been used to further support providers in VBP readiness. The graph on the slide here included um, indicates that rural areas like our region may be more negatively impacted compared to urban areas across the state. The VBP Action Group sought to better understand the limitations in our regional VBP attainment by looking at the gaps, challenges, and successes unique to our region. We thought by better understanding and addressing the limitations, we can then collaboratively work together to find solutions that facilitate further progress. In our region, we also have a very limited number of providers that are currently engaged in VBP contracts. In Kitsap County, only the largest systems, including Peninsula Community Health Services, have VBP contracts in place. Peninsula Community Health Services has probably made it the furthest of providers in the region in the level of VBP contracts that they engage in, taking on both upside and downside risk. In Jefferson County, Jefferson Healthcare engages in some VBP arrangements, but with five MCOs now in the region, they're limited, even as the largest provider in the county. And in Clallam County, North Olympic Healthcare Network and Olympic Medical Center engage in some VBP contracting with MCOs. It's important to know that each MCO has their own approach to partnering with local organizations and tribes and engaging providers in VBP. So for example, Molina Healthcare has piloted VBP contracts with two specialty clinics in Kitsap County, Kitsap Recovery Center and Kitsap Children's Clinic, a pediatric clinic. Both pilot sites are really excited to finally be included in VBP arrangements and express discouragement that opportunities for sustainability or expansion are really limited. Molina is also piloting a community-based organization contract with the Washington Alliance of YMCAs for their diabetes prevention program. Community Health Plan of Washington does not require minimum member attribution thresholds, and they evaluate VBP readiness on a provider-by-provider -provider basis. 
they try to link provider specific VBP arrangements that best fit the intended outcomes for both the MCO and the provider. Community Health Plan of Washington has a unique pilot with a behavioral health agency in King County to create an innovative payment model for low barrier MAT services. And there's interest in expanding that pilot to include additional like providers. United Healthcare has panel limitations for some VBP contract arrangements and starts providers um, with a gap in care before moving on to full risk arrangements. United Healthcare is considering a pilot community-based organization contract with the Washington Alliance of YMCAs as well for memberships and healthy living. Amerigroup has contracts with behavioral health in other areas of the state and focus on MAT and therapy gaps in care achievements. Coordinated Care is piloting a behavioral health contract in other areas of the state. The larger a panel, uh, patient panel size in primary care, the more robust VBP can be offered. MCOs shared with us that they really need to meet providers where they are and arrange contracts that ensure provider success. Much of this is experimenting with what works and broadening promising pilots over time. MCOs are getting really creative in their approaches to VBP and this is a good start. Outside of the pilots mentioned, no other behavioral health or specialty clinics have been offered VBP contracting opportunities in our region. No community-based organizations are engaged in either directly or indirectly through subcontracting value-based contracts. Many behavioral health providers have struggled to successfully implement capitated or per member per month contracts. One SUD provider shared with us, with the intensity of services up front, it takes over a year of consistent engagement and progress to see any return on the time investment. We are losing money. The 2021 Paying for Value survey results could yield additional insights as to the trends and challenges present in our region. So from this work, a common set of regional challenges emerged through um, from the action group, and, and they're represented here on the slide. Rather than prioritizing these challenges, we found that they're really all interrelated, and so we'll just walk through and talk about these one at a time. The first challenge I'll talk about here is metrics. Metrics pose a significant barrier across multiple levels of the system in misalignment, misidentification, and inconsistency. When we look at misidentification, we see that um, we need to ask ourselves, are the metrics the right metrics to begin with? Meaning, do they comprehensively capture the value to the healthcare system and to the patient? VBP metrics can heavily focus on clinical aspects of care. In determining what metrics lead to value, it's important to look at capturing non-medical pieces as well. Thinking about misalignment, in the Olympic region, misaligned metrics increase provider burden, which leads to a limited willingness across providers to participate in VBP and exacerbates the already taxed workforce, resulting in a high administrative burden. With the transition to integrated managed care, many behavioral health providers reported necessarily increasing administrative staff to meet the burden of managing multiple contracts, all with different metrics and requirements. Each MCO has a set of unique metrics that they are held to by the healthcare authority, which are then prioritized by the MCO and can be passed along to partners. Providers in the Olympic region have a very small number of attributed lives under any given MCO, and this leads to the unnecessary split of provider efforts and attention. This doesn't align with how a provider does business. As Peninsula Community Health shares, if you do something for one page, patient, you do it for the entire patient population. You don't pick and choose depending what insurance provider they have. And finally, when we look at inconsistency, we see that changing metrics year to year poses a considerable burden for providers who spend resources, time, and staff capacity to build systems to meet specialized metrics. It's a huge provider investment in both time, money, and resources. Peninsula Community Health Services shared with us that in 2018, the metrics were aligned across all five MCOs. 
then the legislative proviso passed, ensuring measures per plan for MCO improvement. While this was well-intentioned, it has led to increased provider burden. Metrics are sent to MCOs in September, which is challenging for MCOs to then design contracts that work for providers and align with providers' priorities and capacity before the new year begins. This results not just in barriers for the individual provider like we've shared, but for the larger community as well. As communities enhance partnerships and collaboration under Medicaid transformation and other initiatives, the community is encouraged to collaborate and identify local priorities. This collaboration fostered by healthcare authorities' statewide initiatives aligns efforts and leverages strengths to achieve a common goal. Misaligned metrics lead to unnecessary competition for pre provider attention and the limited available resources. Currently, VBP is mainly focused on primary care. While future initiatives like healthcare authorities' primary care transformation model will continue to improve and enhance efforts to improve health outcomes and costs in primary care settings, we know that much of what contributes to an individual's overall health happens outside of the four clinical walls. Engaging additional providers in VBP like behavioral health, specialty care, and community-based organizations will enhance HCA's current efforts to contain costs. When engaging additional provider types, it will be important to align metrics across the various types of providers to align and maximize impact. Changing metrics every year is a big lift. According to Integrated Man Managed Care MCO, that's a mouthful, contract requirements, the 2022 metrics are aligned. In order for MCOs to have the opportunity to alleviate provider burden by aligning metrics, Healthcare authority contract requirements need to stay consistent for a longer period of time. Peninsula Community Health Services also shared with us that providing demo years for proposed metrics can allow providers to build systems and ramp up work to be more successful in future VBP arrangements. This requires more lead time for MCOs to engage in contracting and planning ahead for future metrics. Revisiting the language of the legislative proviso in regards to MCO metrics would also allow for more flexibility to creative VBP arrangements that meet both provider and community needs. Moving on to the next challenge, small numbers. The Olympic region encompasses just 4% of the total Medicaid population in the state. However, about 20% of the people in the region are enrolled in Medicaid. The rural geography, extremely limited footprint of large health systems, and presence of all five MCOs results in limited attributed lives to any one MCO. The health network is largely made up of small, independent providers. This aligns with HCA's paying for value survey findings. An example of this is Jefferson Healthcare. They are the largest provider in Jefferson County, including a critical access hospital, primary care, behavioral health, specialty care, and dental services with locations in Port Townsend, Port Ludlow, and Quilcene. In short, if you live in Jefferson County and are Medica on Medicaid, this is where you go. Jefferson Healthcare serves approximately 6,000 Medicaid lives. Split across five MCOs, this means that no significant population is attributed to any one. As Jefferson Healthcare shared, an MCO may require 2,000 people for a value-based contract. We have 6,000 total, so across five means no value-based contracts are available to us outside of a just basic pay for closing a gap. As the investment for providers to engage in VBP arrangements is extensive, especially in establishing appropriate infrastructure to support success, meaningful revenue is needed, which comes from risk-based contracts. And as we've seen, this mandates size in most cases. Group contracting can be a useful approach for communities like ours. Other rural communities across Washington state may see increased VBP adoption with this approach as well. As noted in the paying for value survey findings, sufficient volume by payer is an enabler of VBP adoption and success. 
Pooling lives across providers within a community is one creative way to create sufficient volume that any one provider in a rural community can't meet alone. Peninsula Community Health Services already engages in some group contracting and uh, CCCN has some experience around group contracting as well. Support of this approach from HCA, as well as pilot programs in small rural communities, can offer an opportunity to spread lessons learned and ultimately better contain costs in rural areas. When considering group contracting, it's essential to not exacerbate provider burden. Additionally, as more collaboration occurs, more partners compete for the same dollars. In order for true collaboration to occur, additional dollars must be made available to properly incent providers to work together. Other related opportunities may include adding scaling based on population size or advocating for flexibility to approach measures and outcomes based on the size of a practice. Also adding additional dollars for a baseline of per member per month to recoup for transformation work. As one provider states, it's the same work to transform regardless of your size. This may align with the primary care transformation model approach and would be beneficial to implement beyond primary care. Next, we look at data. Consistent with healthcare authorities paying for value survey findings, lack of timely and accurate data is an ongoing challenge. Accurate as well as timely data are an essential component to provider quality improvement. It's challenging for providers to make course corrections or adjustments to improve health outcomes when the data that they have is unreliable and or old. The problem with data begins at attribution. For a provider to successfully manage a patient population to lower costs and improve outcomes, they must first know who that includes. Issues with member assignment continue to persist. Many providers share stories of inconsistent assign misassignment. An easy to access system for members, providers, and MCOs to correct attribution quickly is necessary from the beginning. Statewide investments in interoperable data systems and an expedited process to get accurate data into provider hands is also essential. Tools like Collective Medical can be helpful for providers to identify and intervene on costly and inefficient interventions. Community information exchange systems can also be beneficial for closing care gaps. Further, any efforts to expedite claims data is going to be beneficial. Targeted infrastructure investments aid providers to maximize population health management and streamline patient interventions. Data solutions are needed across the payer spectrum, including Medicaid, Medicare, and private insurers. Ensuring good relationships between MCOs and providers to discuss data discrepancies is also essential. Providers need coaching and assistance to understand the data provided to them and how to maximize the incentives that are available to them. Providing data to providers is also challenging for MCOs as each provider wants different data. Statewide alignment in data sharing, for example, simply agreeing to the order of columns and inclusions could streamline data reconciliation for MCOs as well as providers. Next, workforce and administrative burden. Like I've mentioned, the healthcare network here is primarily made up of small providers and even larger health systems are relatively small when compared to neighboring communities like Pierce or King counties. This limits not only clinical staff capacity, but administrative staff as well. For example, Olympic Personal Growth, a small substance use disorder provider in SQUIM, shared their hardest positions to recruit for are actually admin staff. Additionally, workforce shortages continue to severely impact health serving organizations across all levels. The Olympic region is a uniquely rural area that struggles to recruit and retain a quality health serving workforce. All three counties are designated as mental health professional shortage areas. The Olympic region also has the lowest rate of physicians per 100,000 in the state, and we actually know that the true number of physicians is lower due to the high number of retirees and partial FTEs in our region. 
With the transition to integrated managed care, behavioral health providers in the region transitioned from managing one to two contracts to six. The entire contracting process is burdensome, from meetings to negotiations to actually managing contracts and doing the work. This detracts resources from providing the needed services. For example, West End Outreach Services, which is the behavioral health agency in Forks, serves the West End of both Clallam and Jefferson counties. They partner with the neighboring tribes to provide needed crisis services, and services have expanded to offer some substance use disorder supports as well. Prior to 2020, they managed one contract, and today they manage six. Another example on the other end of the region is Kitsap Recovery Center, an inpatient and outpatient substance use disorder treatment facility located in Port Orchard. They are the only medical withdrawal management facility in the Olympic region and provide support to people all the way from the far west end over four hours by private vehicle. Kitsap Recovery is a pilot site for one of the Molina contracts um, and they shared with us that the issues with this pilot were really finding what measures can be measured in the behavioral health setting. Since 2020, the tedium of VBP contract management has only been amplified by COVID-19 barriers. Change on top of change has been difficult to sell to the already taxed workforce and burnout rates continue to rise across all sectors. More and more attention is being turned to the health serving workforce shortage. Investment in programs to promote and increase the workforce like student engagement and its incentives and rural placement programs are helpful to supplement the dwindling existing workforce. In order to retain a quality workforce, reimbursement rates must be increased, particularly for behavioral health in order to offer substantial pay. As one partner shared, it's just, not enough to be able to pay them what they're worth. Group contracting could incent greater collaboration across partners and could address some of the administrative burden as contract management might be able to be hosted in one central agency. Again, this must come with added dollars. Increasing the patient population by pooling providers into one contract could allow for further VBP adoption in rural communities. Addressing workforce is incredibly important with overarching impacts, and it's important to note that workforce investments are a downstream solution and won't immediately improve VBP adoption. Looking at the role of community-based organizations, we know that only about 20% of an individual's health occurs in the four walls of a clinical setting. The rest are made up of socioeconomic factors, physical environment, and health-related behaviors. Community-based organizations are uniquely poised to impact the determinants of health, those conditions like housing, food security, employment, safety. Community-based organizations already possess the expertise, relationships, and the trust to have high impacts on health. It's clear that the Healthcare Authority recognizes the importance of community-based organizations in this work in its renewal waiver application. It makes sense that community-based organizations and related work addressing health-related social needs would be included in some way in VBP. Direction on the role of community-based organizations in VBP has been passive. A roadmap or path has not been set, and this has been left up to local communities and MCOs, but no one knows how or who to engage with. A more direct path for engaging CBOs in this work is needed from healthcare authority. Community-based organizations in the Olympic region have collaborated around forming value propositions and community clinical linkages, but the incentives for clinical providers to include them in contracting is lacking. Many community-based organizations in the region want to participate in VBP, but the path to engage is unclear. Further, community-based organizations oftentimes don't have the infrastructure needed to be successful in VBP. An example of how this can work is the YMCA of Pierce and Kitsap counties, who has independently worked for several years to create and implement an embedded referral system within the EPIC EHR in partnership with Virginia Mason Franciscan Health. 
improving the number of closed loop referrals to diabetes prevention programs can have significant impacts on health outcomes. However, there is no mechanism in place to include groups like the YMCA in a formal VBP contracting process or to incent the healthcare providers to subcontract out for these services. This leads to healthcare providers building new in-house programs that are duplicative, duplicative of services that already exist within the community. The other side of this is many clinical providers have expanded services to address health-related social needs that are lacking in the community, including creative and extensive community engagement, hiring community health workers, and expanding in-house programs. Currently, these services are not reimbursed and their value add is not captured in traditional contracting approaches. Community-based organizations will benefit from infrastructure support to build capacity within local communities. As healthcare authority prioritizes capacity building in their renewal waiver, our region seeks continued flexibility to implement this in a way that works for our local communities. Additionally, capacity building must come with dollars. Community-based organizations operate on incredibly small margins and most funding is not flexible. Flexible funds that allow community-based organizations to build out infrastructure is needed. A clear avenue for community-based organizations to directly contract with MCOs could help in a variety of ways. It can incent CBOs to build necessary infrastructure and expand programs, may increase referral networks and community clinical linkages, as well as provide needed financial stability and relationships to best meet the needs of communities. While not all community-based organizations will be ready to enter into direct contracts with MCOs, more resourced organizations are poised and ready to pilot these efforts. Again, group contracting could incent greater collaboration across partners and sectors, creating more cohesive health networks, and could be an avenue to include community-based organizations directly in contracting while addressing some capacity issues for smaller organizations. Next, when we look at infrastructure, as I mentioned previously, the Olympic region is made up of relatively small providers. Who, limit, who operate on a limited budget and have workforce constraints. They also often lack sophisticated infrastructure to effectively manage VBP contracting complexities. For example, throughout the Olympic region, multiple electronic health records are in use. Among many systems, population health management functionality is severely limited, and most providers have created low-tech systems outside of their electronic health records to supplement these efforts. Most community-based organizations operate without any formal electronic health record, creating barriers to showing their value add in health outcomes. Even when providers are on the same electronic health record, interoperability is not guaranteed. For example, Forks Community Hospital and primary care clinics are moving to EPIC. However, this is a different instance of EPIC than used by the rest of the partners, so it still won't achieve the optimal interoperability. For most health serving partners, systems that don't communicate well with each other and a system to easily close the loop or communicate does not exist. For many years, OCH has explored a region wide bi-directional communication and referral system to attempt to bridge these gaps. Privacy protections, data governance and sustainable funds continue to be persistent barriers to meaningful progress. Statewide investment in interoperable data systems and an expedited process to get accurate data into provider hands is essential to improving health outcomes. Tools like Collective Medical can be helpful for providers to identify and intervene. Community information exchange systems can also be beneficial for closing care gaps. Targeted infrastructure investments aids providers to maximize population health management and streamline patient interventions. So in summary, we found a common set of regional challenges through our value-based action groups work. They also found a common set of solutions that could be put forward to address these challenges, including group contracting, interoperable data system investment, 
speeding up data reconciliation processes, including additional provider types and value-based payment arrangements, aligning metrics across different provider types, increasing reimbursement rates, statewide workforce investments, community-based organization capacity building, baseline funding for transformation, direct MCO and community-based organization contracting, and investment in a community information exchange tool. Again, the purpose of this presentation was really to promote advancement of healthcare authorities' efforts to transform healthcare. We've provided a look at the challenges, successes, and opportunities in the region in hopes that it will guide future decision making and regional next steps. So with that in mind, with that in mind, we pose these questions. Where does the healthcare authority see alignment with other planned initiatives like the primary care transformation model, the Washington integrated care assessment, the renewal waiver, care coordination, et cetera? And how can this information inform healthcare authorities' strategy for implementation of planned initiatives? We're also curious, what can we collaboratively address now? Where do we start? And what maybe should we leave for another day? And finally, we ask, how can the VBP Action Group and or OCH support next steps? Thank you so much for your time. If you have questions or want to talk more about this information, please feel free to reach out to OCH at OlympicCH.org. We really look forward to continuing to partner with you in this important work.